Great, we're just giving everybody a few minutes to get in and connected. I see that the, the room is filling up with attendees, so that's great. Um, so I'm Mindy Buchanan. I'm the Director of Patient Programs here at the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. And it's my pleasure to introduce you all to uh, our great webinar on demystifying COVID-19 recommendations. So it's gonna be good information tonight. Uh, I also want to officially thank our uh, sponsors for this event, Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals for their support um, of this event. And uh, so thank you to Mallinckrodt. And uh, just to get started, there is a bit of housekeeping. So as you guys know, uh, this is a webinar. We are not able to hear or see you. If you have questions, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Usually if you're on a Mac, it's at the bottom. If you're on a PC, sometimes it's at the top. Uh, but go ahead and put your questions in throughout the webinar. There will be time for Q&A after uh, Dr. Harper's presentation. So with that, it's also my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Logan Harper. He is a pulmonologist at Cleveland Clinic. He focuses his clinical time on providing comprehensive care for sarcoidosis patients as part of Cleveland Clinic Sarcoidosis and Interstitial Lung Disease Center. His research interests include developing patient-centered interventions to reduce health disparities in sarcoidosis related to race and income, as well as novel sarcoidosis treatments. Welcome, Dr. Harper. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that really kind introduction, Mindy. Um, I'm really glad everybody came, and I, and I wanted to thank the FSR for putting on this um, this um, presentation and giving me a, a chance to talk. Um, as, as Mindy said, I am Logan. I'm one of the sarcoidosis phys physicians at uh, Cleveland Clinic. And I also work in the ICU where we spent the last two um, years really uh, wrestling with um, COVID. And I'm very excited to give this um, talk about the current COVID guidelines and how they apply to, sar to sarcoidosis patients. Um, let me share my screen and then we can get going. Okay. Um, so I've structured this talk around four basic questions that I get asked on, on, an, on an almost daily basis. Um, first, patients and doctors have been at times confused by the huge amount of data and recommendations, um, as well as the frequent changes we've um, had around COVID. Um, knowing where to get infor information has become really important. Um, second, often the most important information is, fig is figuring out what our, what our risk is of catching COVID and what our risk is of having a severe outcome. Um, I wanted to provide evidence on the risk to sarcoidosis patients um, and patients on treatment for sarcoidosis um, in, um, as, it, as it relates to catching COVID. Um, third, I wanted to talk a bit about vaccines. Um, I'm sure all of you are tired about hearing vaccines, uh, about hearing about vaccines at this point. So I want to focus on the three main questions I get asked, which are, um, which are, should I get a vaccine? Which one and how many? Um, and finally, as COVID numbers are, dr are dropping, we are once again in the situation of figuring out how best to go back to our um, lives outside of our home offices and our Zoom calls. Um, I wanted to provide a framework for patients to decide what is best for them. Um, so first, I wanna talk ab about where to get good information. Um, for all the confusion that there's been, the CDC really does have a great centralized COVID-19 website that is updated frequently and, and is very helpful for figuring out what the current recommendations are. Um, I've provided the link for the website, but honestly, the easiest, the easiest way is just using um, your favorite search engine and looking for CDC COVID-19. 
Um, and the website looks like this once you get there. Um, we'll talk we'll talk more about this website later in the talk. Um, the FSR likewise has a great COVID-19 page with up-to-date recommendations. Um, again, go to go to your favorite internet search, look for FSR COVID, um, and the website looks like this. Um, and then finally, but certainly not least, um, always feel free to, um, to reach out to your medical team if you're unsure how to put all of these different recommendations together. Um, now I want to talk about what the risk is from sarcoidosis for developing COVID. Um, at this point, we don't really have convincing evidence that having sarcoidosis is a rich is a is a is a risk factor for catching COVID. Um, the main data we have from this comes from a study done by the FSR and multiple sarcoidosis institutions. Um, they surveyed um, 5,000 patients with sarcoidosis in the USA and abroad. Um, and they found that the rate of the rate of infection was variable, but it but it but it wasn't higher than in the, than in other groups of um, patients. It's worth noting that this work was done before before vaccines came came out. Um, also, in the FSR study, um, they looked for. They looked for what sorts of medications were associated with having a worse outcome from sarcoidosis, um, and what and the main finding was that only rituximab was associated with being hospitalized or having a severe outcome. Um, again, this was done before the vaccine roll rollout. Um, after the vaccine rollout, this is the best. This is this is the best the best data I was able to find comparing the rates of comparing the rates of infection um, after vaccination for Im for immunocompromised patients and patients who didn't have any immunocom um, who didn't have any immunosuppression um, on this graph. Um, the blue line that I've pointed out to is rheumatoid arthritis patients um, who are treated very similarly to sarcoidosis um, patients. Um, and you can see that there's really a very small increase in breakthrough infections. So infections after vaccination compared to patients who don't have any immunodeficiency. Um, the yellow line um, of of patients who are having a lot of breakthrough infections is patients who have who have had an organ transplant. Um, so that isn't particularly surprising. Um, the other the other interesting thing we saw in this study is that um, of those who of those who get infected after having after having the vaccine. Um, there, there is actually a very low, low chance of having um, a severe COVID, COVID infection, and the rate is lower um, after vaccination. Um, they also saw that um, that after vaccination, even pay, it, even people who are immunosuppressed have a lower chance of being hospitalized. All of this telling us what we know that getting vaccinated really is the most important thing to do. Um, and I just wanted to highlight really quickly how, how effective the, the vaccine has been at preventing deaths. Um, on this slide, you can see that um, most of the deaths are happening in, in patients who are both unvaccinated and over the age of of 65, particularly patients over the age of 80. Um, and finally, it is it it is important to keep in to keep in mind that there are other that there are other risk factors beside immunosuppression or sarcoidosis that are really important in COVID. 
Um, we know um, that patients treated with treated for sarcoidosis are often treated on steroids, um, and treatment and treatment with steroids can 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 lead to obesity, diabetes, and high blood and high blood pressure that are all known to increase the risk of severe COVID. Um, one study that looked at 969 patients ed, 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 admitted with COVID, only 54 of them were fully vaccinated. Of those 54, almost half of them didn't have any symptoms. Of the people who did, who did have who did have severe disease, the average age was 80, was 80 years old. 80% um, of them had 80% of them had heart disease and 64% were um, obese, while only four of, of those patients were on, on immunosuppressant medication. Um, and I think what this highlights is that immunosuppression isn't the only important factor for thinking about who's at risk of breakthrough COVID. So given all that, I, I want us all to think about risk as a continuum. Um, there's some patients at low risk of having, of having a breakthrough case of COVID after they're vaccinated. And this is likely um, sarcoidosis patients who aren't on any treatment and aren't having any symptoms. Um, moving up, higher risk patients are patients who are on, on immunosuppressant medication, have diabetes, obesity, or are older than age 65. Um, a little bit higher, th higher than that is probably patients who have taken rituximab in particular, or have severe fibrotic lung disease from their sarcoidosis. And then up at the highest, at the highest risk are people who are, who are over the age of 80. Um, and the absolute highest, highest risk are those who are unvaccinated. Um, and I do, and I do want to highlight that. This picture I've drawn is more to give you a sense of the um, relative risk, and these aren't in any means um, exact measurements of the risk of these patient groups. Um, the other important part of gauging your risk of catching of catching COVID is knowing how how much COVID is active in your in your area. Um, your risk of, of catching COVID is obviously much higher if we're at the levels of COVID we had back back in Jan in January than they are now when the levels really do seem to be coming down. Um, the best place I, I I have found to to figure out how active COVID is in your area is the CDC website that we looked at earlier. If you go to the Your Health tab. Um, you can then go to COVID-19 by county, and then you can enter your state and your county, and then that'll tell you if there's high, medium, or low um, trans transmission of COVID. Um, it will also give you um, the CDC's recommendation of what you should do to protect yourself from COVID at that trans at that trans at that transmission level, if you if you aren't immunocompromised or or have any of the comorbidities that I said earlier, um, I think this website will probably be more be more helpful if we get into into a situation where the COVID rates start going back up again. Um, obviously, we're hoping that doesn't happen. Um, so to summarize, your risk is definitely modified by how much COVID is in your area, your underlying health conditions, and what treatment treatment you're you're on. Um, highest highest risk is being unvaccinated. Intermediate risk is any is any of these factors listed listed here. And having asymptomatic sarcoidosis that isn't that isn't requiring any treatment 
um, is probably at an at a lower level of um, of um, risk. Um, so now that we've talked about risk, I want to talk. Uh, I want to talk about what you can do to um, protect yourself. Um, so first off, let's talk. Let's talk about vaccines briefly. Um, I think the best guidance I've seen for vaccines is from the American College of Rheumatology that has provided really great vaccine guide guidelines focused on patients with autoimmune or um, inflammatory disease. Um, you can actually read these guidelines yourself if you um, want with a quick with a quick Google search. Um, I think the important points to point out are first that um, they say there is no known contraindication outside of an actual allergy to one of the vaccine components to getting a COVID vaccine. Um, and I would say if you do think you have an allergy to one of the, co of the vaccine components, seeing an allergist to discuss um, what, that, what that means is a good idea. Because if you are allergic to one of the vaccines, there's definitely a chance that one of the other vaccines you're um, not allergic to. Um, they also they also recommend that everybody get a COVID a COVID vaccine, regardless of having a past COVID um, infection. And then also they mentioned that they recommend a COVID vaccine. Um, despite the potential risk of causing a disease flare, given that we can control a disease flare of sarcoidosis, but but COVID can be much more tricky and 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 um, and does have a relatively high chance of of having a bad out outcome. Um, so once you decide to get vaccinated, the next question is, which vaccine should you get? Um, there really is a broad consensus that the mRNA vaccines, so those are the um, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, have better efficacy and less side effects than the J&J &J, J &J vaccine. Um, I, have, I have up here um, both, both the CDC recommendations and the American College of Rheumatology's recommendations. Um, when it says AIIRD, that stands for auto, auto, autoimmune and inflammatory disease patients. Um, so what we've seen is the mRNA vaccines reduce, reduce the risk of COVID infection by 95% compared to, to only a 66% reduced risk with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, so now that you know which vaccine to get, the final question is how, is, is how many vaccines should I get? And this, and this has been a real point of confusion because this really has changed multiple times. Um, again, I think the CDC really has it laid out very nicely um, for, um, for us. You can see here in, in this chart that for patients older than 18 who aren't moderately or severely immunocompromised, they recommend on initial two shots, one to two months apart, followed, followed by a third shot five months after the initial shots. For patients who are moderately or severely immune compromised, they they um, recommend a three shot in initial series, so one shot every month, followed by a fourth booster shot three months after the third shot. Um, it's definitely important to talk with your healthcare practitioner whether you qualify as moderately or severely immunocompromised because there's definitely a little bit of um of um wiggle room there and and um and um your individual medical history will will definitely impact if your doctor recommends that you're in the four shot series or the three shot series <laughs>
Um, so now that so now that we've talked about um, about risk and how to and how to handle vaccines, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, which I think is uh, masks and social distancing. Um, so masks and social distancing have been kind of controversial through this whole through this whole epidemic, and as we're and as we're coming to a place where there's less COVID out there, um, I definitely think there's been a lot of focus on what we can do for patients who are who are who are who are healthy, um, and it's been harder for patients who have pre-existing condi pre-existing conditions or are treated with immunosuppressants to to really figure out what the best course of action is for them. Um, so I want to address this question by looking at two really important questions. Does a, does a mask offer protection? And when can I stop social distancing and wearing a mask? So the data on, the data on masks for individuals is tricky. Um, we obviously have ample data that in groups that in that in that in groups of people, if everybody wears a wears a mask or 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 if most people wear a wear a mask, that we're able to really decrease the transmission of COVID. I couldn't find any studies that individually address if immunosuppressed patients wearing a wearing a wearing a mask after being vaccinated when other people weren't wearing weren't wearing masks if that provided any benefit um, and i think that's that's a really tricky question to answer um, the closest the closest i could find um, were there were there were studies back in back at the beginning of covid before we had vaccines, where they looked at patients, where they looked at people who were known to have COVID, who were wearing a mask, and did they trans transmit it to other people? And masks really helped in in those situ in those situations. Um, I've seen I've seen numbers everywhere from on from on eleven percent of um, risk all the way up to a 75% reduction of um, risk. So it's really hard to estimate exactly how much benefit a mask helps. I will say I, I can't, it's very, it's very hard for me to imagine that a mask does, does nothing. Um, we know that we, we know that masks slow the, slow the, slow the spread of COVID. So they must have some efficacy at keeping people safe individually. So if you're going to wear a mask, the next question is which is which mask should I wear? Um, this study isn't a perfect, isn't a perfect study. They asked people what type of what type of mask they wore and then asked them had they developed and then followed them to see had they developed COVID. And what they found is the more intense the mask was, the less likely they were of developing COVID. The potential problems of this study are, you can certainly imagine that someone wearing an, wearing an N95 mask behaves differently than someone wearing a cloth mask. They may be more likely to be vaccinated. They may be more likely to. Um, they may be more likely to social distance. Their their friends may be more likely to be vaccinated and social distance. Um, but I think it. I think it. I think it makes sense that if you're going to choose to wear a to wear a mask, why wouldn't you wear a um, Why wouldn't you wear a um, mask that had that had the highest chance of blocking out viral particles. So in summary, um, we know that we know that masks reduce the COVID spread in the community. It likely it, and it and it and it likely reduces individual risk, but I but I can't tell you how much.
Um, and I think if you're going to wear a mask and you don't have any huge comfort differences between a cloth mask and an N95, I would choose the N95. The final question that I think is really challenging to end is, is when can someone who has pre-existing medical conditions stop social distancing and masking? Um, again, I want to think about safety as a continuum. Um, so at, at the polls, we could give up all of our COVID, all of our COVID, all of our COVID protective measures now and just go back to how things were. At the other poll, we could choose to we could choose to really never leave our houses again until COVID is until COVID is eradicated. Um, I don't think either. I don't think. Um, but I think most of us will probably choose somewhere in the middle. And I think the best way to just to to decide where in the middle you fall is to kind of superimpose where your level of risk is. I don't think anyone, I don't think any anyone wants to or necessarily should stay, stay, stay in, in the house and kind of avoid all social interaction until COVID's over. Um, but for those at highest, at highest risk, which are those who are who are unvaccinated, over than 80, on on a drug like on a drug on um on um on um rituximab or have severe pul pulmonary fibrosis considering masking and social distancing in public as you're able and and maybe even wearing a mask when you're with unvaccinated family and friends could be a reasonable personal decision on the other end patients who have sarcoidosis but don't have any real symptoms and aren't on any immunosuppression and don't have any organ damage may say, hey, I'm only going to going to mask up if I'm in if I'm in a very crowded, crowded place. Um, and then there's people who fall who fall in the in the in the middle. So patients who are on some sort of immunosuppressant regimen have diabetes have diabetes, obesity, or high blood pressure. And they may say, listen, I'm gonna mask up anytime I am, I am in a public place because that's what makes me feel comfortable. Um, I think this is going to be a really nuanced and, um, and personal conversation that you should have with your family, your doctor, um, and figure out where the, and figure out what level of risk you are most comfortable with. Um, Again, I want to emphasize this chart isn't isn't a specific recommendation of what people should do at 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 different levels of um, risk. I just wanted to provide this as a conceptual framework for how you could think about risk. Um, and then finally, before before we wrap up, I wanted to touch a little bit on long on long COVID. Um, we've been hearing more and more about it, about it in the news, um, and I wanted to frame it ar around three questions. What is long COVID? What are the risk factors for long COVID? And what can we do to prevent or treat long COVID? Um, so long COVID has a lot of definite, a lot of definitions, and it's not a completely well-defined entity yet. In general, what, what we're looking at are patients who after recovering from COVID have persistent symptoms of fatigue, shortness of breath, pain, headaches, um, which the more, I, the more I look into it kind of looks like symptoms we see pretty commonly in sarcoidosis. Um, so this study from 2021 looked at looked at electronic medical records and looked at what the incidence was of all of these symptoms after COVID. Over on the left, you can see that, um, that, that patients are having symptoms up to six months after COVID um, and that abnormal breathing, fatigue and anxiety and depression are really common. Over on the right hand side, 
you see where they compared the incidence of these symptoms to how common these symptoms were in patients who had the flu. Um, they did this because since they were just looking at the electronic medical record, they couldn't really tell if the symptoms were new. So they, so what, so what they hypothesized was any symptoms that are out that are that are that are more than we see in patients who just who just had the flu are probably attributable to the COVID. Um, and you can see um, at the bottom with the with the hexagons, um, which are actually nonagons, um, that fatigue, um, abnormal breathing, all of those symptoms um, are are um, more common with patients who had COVID, represented by the represented by the by the red by the red line than they are in patients who had the flu, represented by the thin green line in the middle. Um, so now that we know long COVID exists, the next question is obviously what are the risk factors for it? Um, and honestly, we've had a hard time teasing this out. Um, this is this is a study where they looked at patients who had long COVID. Um, and then over on the left-hand side is a list of possible, of possible things that we thought would predict long COVID. And then the bars you see in the middle, if they cross that central dotted line, that means the predictor wasn't predicting long COVID. And you can see that, that, all, that all of those lines cross the central dotted, dotted line which tells us that none of these predictors on 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 the left hand side were a were a were a risk factor for long COVID. Um, so at this point, I don't have any data that says that sarcoidosis patients or immunosuppressed patients are at higher risk of long COVID. The only the only risk factors I saw mentioned more than more than a couple times were really um, younger age and female gender. So the obvious question now is, well, how do we prevent prevent long long COVID? Um, and happily, um, a a recent study by the um, UK Health and Security Agency found that found that vaccination before catching COVID did reduce the chances that someone would develop long, long COVID. Um, and, there's, and there's even some evidence that getting vaccinated after you develop long COVID may help with the symptoms too. Um, so, so, so here at our COVID clinic, we're, we are um, really focused on making sure that there's no um, other cause for the symptoms offering COVID vaccination, and then working with um, physical therapy, respiratory therapy to help with the symptoms of shortness of breath, fatigue, and pain. Um, the good news is those symptoms do seem to improve with time for many patients. Um, I'm interested to see where the long COVID research takes us. Um, many authors have noted that the symptoms of long COVID, this um, the fatigue and the joint pain um, is common in a lot of autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, including sarcoidosis. And I'm and I'm and I'm hopeful that maybe in the, that that maybe in the in the long term this will um, lead to some new treatments for fatigue. Um, well, thank you all for your time. Um, thank you for the FSR for setting this up and for having me come to talk. Um, and I would love to take this time to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Harper. We do already have some questions in here. And just as a reminder to folks, um, if you raise your hand in the raise hand function, we can't actually answer it because it is a webinar. Um, but we do encourage you to add your questions to the Q&A function. And if you don't see it on your screen and you see the chat, go ahead and add it there. That's okay too. But we do prefer it in the Q&A section so we can kind of uh, share questions that are answered here. So um, thank you again, Dr. Harper, for this great presentation. I will go ahead and start listing off some of these questions we have. <laughs> okay, great. Um, 
So we have a question on um, for those folks who are boosted, when do they need to consider whether or not they need additional boosters? Is it at the six month mark or one year mark? And I don't know you had a slide on this, but mm -hmm. we could just touch on this again. Yeah, so let's go back. And I will say the boosters are definitely on, are definitely on evolving, on um, evolving area. Um, and the answers I give you today aren't going to be the answers long-term. Um, right now, the only booster that is that is recommended is the fourth is the fourth booster. Um, and the data I've seen on it is that the fourth booster, while it's helpful, um, it doesn't provide a huge amount of extra benefit. Um, so it'll be interesting to see when we dis, um, when the evidence points to a fifth or a sixth booster being being needed. We're still, learning how long it takes for the immunity from the vaccine to wane. But at at this point, I would say a fourth booster is all anyone's recommended for. Great, thank you. And so actually on that topic, and we did you did mention a couple other comorbidities that might put people at additional risk outside of sarcoidosis. Um, would type 1 diabetes be one of those risks for a second yeah. booster? So it's tricky with the booster um, because the booster, what it does is it helps people who didn't who didn't mount on who didn't mount on appropriate immunologic vax, um, Im, immunologic response to the first um, to the first several shots. Um, I am not aware of data that type one diabetics have a hard time mounting on immunologic response from the COVID from from the COVID vaccine. Um, I do think this is definitely one of those questions that talking that talking with your endocrinologist will be very important um, because there definitely is a, a little bit of wiggle room for doctors um, for us to kind of um, gauge our patients risk and make a really informed comprehensive decision. Um, so all I can really say for type one diabetes is it definitely, if you weren't vaccinated, would increase the risk of a severe of a severe infection. Um, I think the vaccine definitely offers you a strong protection against COVID, and you would and you should talk with your endocrinologist about if that booster is right for you. Thank you. We also have a question about antibody tests. Um, and I know that we've had sort of a topic on this on past webinars. And so folks are asking about whether or not it's worthwhile getting an antibody test um, and what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I didn't see any obvious recommendations where an antibody test was helpful. Um, they're, being, they're, being, they're being used a lot in research. Um, and there's definitely been times where we saw a, a very improved antibody count, but that didn't actually translate to better protection from COVID. Um, now, are there patients where a doctor may order that? I could imagine someone who is on very strong immunosuppressants, your doctor saying, hey, let's get an, let's get an antibody test and see if maybe we're gonna go off book and, and try an extra vaccine. And that could definitely be reasonable. But I think for the general population, antibody tests aren't particularly helpful right now. Thank you. We do have a question around um, how protected folks are with just two doses and no booster. Um, we, of, yeah, we yeah. definitely think, um, I, I definitely strongly recommend the third shot for, every, for everybody. Um, I don't have data of exactly how how diminished the protection is without the third, um, but it's definitely less, and everyone should should get that third shot. Great. Um, so we do have a question actually about, and and you know there may be questions out here that we're not able to answer today, yeah. folks, uh, because uh, one of the and I think this comes from the from the presentation as well. We don't have that much information we don't have just years and years and years of information and so we um so hopefully we'll, we'll try here so um we have a question about someone who has long covid currently 
and would like to know if there's anything they could be doing to kind of mitigate those um, symptoms, particularly fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, fatigue's a really challenging symptom in really just about every disease where it's common, including sarcoidosis. Um, we know daily exercise helps. Um, there's some data that getting vaccinated if, if you're not vaccinated helps. Um, outside of that, I would definitely encourage um, anyone with long COVID to find one of the many um, long COVID clinics that have been set up at hospitals all, all over the country. Um, there's a lot of really great work being done. Um, and I think that's the best bet to really find, um, find potentially new treatments. Thank you. Um, we also have a question uh, around this, you know, the FDA just approved a second booster shot for people over 50. Um, and are there any sort of reasons that someone wouldn't get it if they are over 50, even if they're not immunocompromised? Yeah. Um, in general, I haven't found any convincing reasons not to get the COVID vaccine when it's offered, um, if it's offered within guide, within guidelines. Um, COVID really is, is really a very nasty disease, um, and I haven't seen severe side, severe side effects, and the data backs up that, side, that, that, that severe side effects are very rare. Thank you. Um, we have a question about folks who have um, been long-term immunocompromised um, and should they be more caught? I mean, we've already talked about vaccines. So yes to vaccines, mm -hmm. uh, getting vaccinated there, but um, that you're saying, uh, but are there other things they should be doing to be more cautious, like on that risk yeah. scale, yeah. if there's someone who's had 20 years of immunosuppressive drugs? Yeah. And I think it is less, oh, sorry, sorry, Mindy. it is sorry, it is, it is less the duration of the immunosuppression and, and more how strong it is right now. Um, and I think that's a really important conversation to have with, with your doctor who's prescribing the immunosuppression and get on and, and get an idea. Are you very heavily Immunosuppressed them. I see someone here has a transplanted heart and they're on four different immunosuppressants. They probably fall into a more highly immunosuppressed cate category than someone who say has been on five on five milligrams of prednisone for the last 20, 20 years and really isn't that immunosuppressed. Um, and then, so after you talk to your doctor and you figure out, are you at high risk or low risk? Um, I think high risk people, the most I would probably do at this point would be um, if I'm with people who could be unvaccinated, I would just wear a N95 mask. Um, if, you're out, if you're out hiking by yourself, you probably don't need to. Um, if you're in a crowded store, it's probably a good idea. Um, and then talk with your doctor ab about how, uh, how aggressive they think you, you should be with masking and social distancing. And know that that'll change over the next couple months based on a lot of things. Thank you. So we do have a question actually about um, whether or not there, I mean, in there's been a lot of stuff in the news about preventative treatments for COVID. Um, and what are your thoughts on that as far as uh, yeah. efficacy goes? Yeah, so th those treatments seem, seem to have good efficacy. The problem is accessing them at this point is still very challenging. Um, I know here, um, everywhere really, it's very difficult to get those treatments. Um, so if you have COVID and you're offered them, I think it's a good idea. Um, but know that if you get COVID, there's definitely a chance that for the next couple months, maybe longer, you, your doctors won't, won't be able to get it for you, um, which is why even though we have those treatments, vaccines are still so important. Thank you. So we do have a couple of questions about um, sort of vaccine um, reactions. Um, one is around having um, 
ringing in their ears um, after the second dose of the vaccine and, and whether or not they should potentially not get the third one, a booster, the first booster. Um, and I think the other one was about I saw whether blood or not clots. Blood clots. Yes, you have a question about blood clots and a question about rashes that persist for months based on okay. after getting the vaccine. Okay. Um, so it's really hard without seeing seeing anyone to tell if this is a vaccine reaction or or not. Um, and I think this again falls into our falls into our risk spectrum. Um, if someone is very concerned that they had a vaccine reaction and they have no medical comorbidities and they were vaccinated, it in a conversation with their doctor, they might choose not to get a booster. Um, if someone is, if someone has a lot of risk factors for severe COVID and is immunosuppressed and is advanced age, and the and, and the side effect was mild. Um, there may be a decision that, hey, even if this was a side effect, my risk of death from COVID is pretty high, so I don't want that. Um, so I think that's unfortunately a question I'm going to have to punt to everybody's, doc everybody's doctor. And I know everyone is so tired of, of hearing that, but there really is so much new nuance in these decisions. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, so we have a question about whether or not there's research of the immune system overworking if you get COVID um, and a concern about additional scarring in the lungs after COVID, after having contracted COVID. Um, let me find that. Is that, is, is that, actually, yeah. is that like independent of the vaccine or just it, is that like, does COVID make sarcoidosis worse? Is that the impression? I think the question is if, yeah, if you have COVID, um, the person, if they want to clarify, if we're not getting the, 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 the question correct here, but I believe it's if you get COVID, um, could, should you be concerned with having additional scarring in the lungs post having oh, contracted? Yeah. So we definitely do see that. Um, usually it's from, Usually if it happens, it's from being on the ventilator or from having really severe infiltrates from the COVID. Um, I haven't seen a lot of data of does COVID, um, of does COVID um, increase autoimmune or um, inflammatory disease. Um, and that could definitely just be, I haven't seen it because there is a lot of data coming out on a daily basis. Um, but um, yes, there can be lung scarring after COVID. It's actually relatively common if you compare it to other respiratory viruses. Um, the best things we can do to avoid that is everything is everything we've talked about to minimize the risk of having severe COVID, which is minimizing co comorbidities, lowering your risk of having COVID, and if you get COVID, having good, high quality ICU care. Great, thank you. So we do have a question actually about someone who got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and got the first booster. Um, should they be seeking out, it may be they're under 50, but should they be seeking out the a net, another booster? Hmm. The Johnson & Johnson plus one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to add, Ad, admit, I don't know that off the top of my head. Um, I would ask, I would definitely bring that up with your doctor. I just don't, I just don't know that off the top of my head and I don't, and I don't, and I don't want to guess. I'd, I'd have to look it up. That seems reasonable. Thank you. Um, Let's see, we have, oh, we have a question about new variants. Um, how likely are, and you know, none of us have a crystal ball, but how yeah. likely are new variants? Um, and so potentially how threatening might new variants be? Yeah, I wish I knew. Maybe I'm glad I don't though. Um, there definitely could be, could be new, new variants. We've seen how it, we've seen how it um, mutates and there's definitely, evidence of new surges in China and Europe right now. Maybe, maybe not surges, but rising case, rising case incidents. 
Um, so I think it's something where we're doing better now, but we can't, but we can't claim that this is over yet. Um, so I'm going to say, I hope not. Um, I think we've gotten a lot of people vaccinated and the people who, who weren't vaccinated had um, Omicron in, in December, um, but we'll see. I hope not. Yeah, I think we all hope, we definitely all hope not. Um, so I feel like we've gotten through quite a lot of these questions here <clears throat> um, and some of them are sort of repeating, but uh, we do have a question actually, and maybe maybe we don't know this actually, um, but are there any connection between the pneumonia um, vaccine and benefits for not contracting COVID? I suspect mm -hmm. is what they're yeah. thinking there. Not that I know of. Um, the the pneumonia vaccine teaches your body to fight off um, parts of a parts of one type of bacteria called pneumococcal pneumonia, um, and bacteria and viruses are very different, and those parts wouldn't overlap. Um, so the so the pneumonia vaccine doesn't protect you from COVID, um, and I don't know if there's any other odd immune mo modulating effects, but I wouldn't expect there to be. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so I think we've gotten through most of these questions um, that, that Dr. Harper can answer tonight, uh, or today, I guess. Um, oh, there's a question about Delta Cron <laughs> and whether that's spreading in the US and is it more severe than Omicron? I don't know yet. Um, it's hard to define severe too, because like, do you define, do you define severe as does it spread more, more rapidly or do you spread or, or do you define severe as more people in the ICU? Um, I can say at my hospital, um, we haven't seen a second, we haven't seen a post Omicron surge yet. Um, and I'm, I haven't been detailedly following other other areas. Um, so at this point, I, I, I can't say. There's probably a virologist who can, but I'm a sarcoidosis guy, so. Fair enough. Um, we do have a question that actually was submitted earlier uh, about that. So there's been in the news that the airlines are asking to get rid of the mask requirements uh, on planes. And so if you're someone, <clears throat> and I know that you have the risk, that risk slide, which is great, if you're someone um, who might be at higher risk of COVID, um, should they potentially not fly or should they definitely wear a mask when they're flying? Yeah. I think, uh, again, unfortunately, conversation with your doctor, but I think, I think we, should all, we should all work to go back to our lives as we're able, especially since numbers are, are, going, are going down. I think wearing an N95 on a plane isn't gonna hurt anybody and could definitely help. Um, so I think for most people, I, I would say, yeah, why don't you wear an N95? Everybody hates being sick after a flight anyway. Um, if someone's incredibly Im immunosuppressed like a solid organ trans transplant, I would definitely talk with your healthcare team. About whether or not to fly. Yeah, about whether or not flying is a good idea. Great, thank you. Excellent. Well, I think we got through all of our questions here. Unless someone wants to add one at the last minute, um, I invite you to go ahead and do that. But otherwise, um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Harper for such a great webinar and excellent information. And for all of you out there, you will get a copy of this uh, recording, uh, and we'll also provide a PDF of this slide information and all the links that Dr. Harper mentioned today as well. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mindy. Always good to be here. Ah, very good. It's so great to have you. And thank you to everybody who came and attended. Uh, and we will all see you soon. Thank you so much.